Good morning. How's everybody this morning? Good? Wide awake? You know, everybody's, you know, not hung over from the last Christmas party they went to or anything like that, right? Man, I'll just tell you, Christmas season is in full thing. I've been at more Christmas parties in the last week than, you know, I would have thought. And so... Uh, last night we had an awesome time here. There's still some cookies out there, and if you're like, man, I can't eat cookies right now, I just want to tell you, I saw on a meme on the internet that the calories don't count for Christmas cookies, so go ahead and fill up. Um, but man, we're super excited about uh, this morning. A couple real quick things just to make sure you have them on your calendar. Next Sunday is going to be the coolest, most awesome, ugly sweater Sunday that ever was. So find your most ugly or beautiful sweater. I won't judge you if you think your sweater is beautiful, but wear that next week. I have one coming in the mail I am super stoked about. Uh, so make sure you bring one. It's going to be awesome. Just a good time just to be silly with one another. Uh, I think the Lord really likes it when we laugh together. And uh, then the 24th, so Christmas Eve service, 7 o'clock, uh, 7 p.m. We'd love to have you come just to worship our Savior uh, on Christmas Eve together. So make sure you put those on your calendar and uh, we'll see you there. So with that, if you guys would stand up, we're going to get ready just to, to worship this morning. So let me pray and we'll kick it off. Jesus, we just thank you for the Christmas season. We thank you that we get to just worship you and love you and remember uh, that you came into this world uh, to fulfill your promise, to fill the prophecy of saving us. And so as we come this morning to worship you, Lord, I just pray that you would just let this week that we have just gone through and all the fun or hard stuff, all the things in between, just go away where we can just come before you and worship you. Pray that in your name. Amen. The first Noel, the angels did say, was to certain poor shepherds in fields as they lay. In fields where they lay keeping their sheep on a cold that was so deep. Noel, 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 born is the King of Israel. They look Thank you. 
shepherd so scared I'll rejoice and declare that hope was born this night. Glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Let all of the world sing a chorus of joy because hope was born this night. For you, surely wait for you, for your love 
is my delight. I will wait for you, I will wait for you through the storm and through the night. I will wait for you, surely wait for you, for your love is my delight. Jesus, this morning we just worship you with our hearts and our voices. We come with grateful hearts and we thank you that you humbled yourself to be born of a woman and that you, you came into this world so humbly and you grew and you lived a life perfect. You lived your life with the cross in mind, and this morning we just, we thank you and we praise you for leaving the glory of heaven and coming into the broken world that you created to be the light of the world. Lord, we thank you for the hope of heaven, that this is only just a blink in all of eternity and that we have eternity to spend with you in heaven, and we thank you and praise you for that. Lord, we just call on you today to just be our wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. We know that we can come to you with all of our hurts and our pain and know that you will carry us and that you will cover us with your wings. And so we pray that this morning. And Lord, we just thank you and lift up your name because we know that this is only the beginning and that there's so much more ahead of us. We thank you for that. We thank you for your sacrifice. We pray that through the Holy Spirit, you would teach us truth as we look into your word, that you would humble, our, humble us to be able to hear what you have for us today. And Lord, I pray that you would change us and that we would leave this place a little bit different, that we would be more like you, Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. It is good to be with you this morning as we come to celebrate the birth of a Savior, Jesus Christ the Lord. This, this past week, it's been a tough week. Um, we've, we've had part of the body here, a young mom by the name of Diana Swopes that went home to be with the Lord on a Wednesday night. And I think it caught us a little all off guard. We know we're all going to go to be with the Lord someday. We just don't know when. But we do know the scripture tells us to live one day at a time. If you're like me, you're a bit of a planner and you're always looking to what's coming up, but um, I think we need to get up every morning, look up, and say thank you, Lord, for this day, and help, help me to live for you this day. Diana was, well, she was a little girl that I watched uh, grow up that used to love to run in hay fields. She was full of life. She had two young girls herself, Mylea and Lyric, that we dedicated right here in this church. She was married here in this church. But right now, she's with the Lord. Paul tells us in this life, we, we see dimly. Sometimes we're not going to have all the answers to our questions why. I think one of the first men in the Bible to ever ask why was, was Job, which is the oldest book of the Bible. And Job went chapter after chapter asking why. But we know from the prophet Isaiah that God's ways aren't our ways and his thoughts 
or in our thoughts. God sees the big eternal picture, and sometimes we just see what's right in front of us. And we need to remember who we belong to and who we're going to be with forever. So let's go to where we find our hope and our refuge and our rock of strength, the Lord Jesus Christ, and have a word of prayer before we begin this morning. Lord Jesus, you were the one that told us to not let our hearts be troubled, that if we believed in God, we were also to believe in you, and that you were going to go to prepare a place for us, a forever place, where we would all be together again one day in heaven. And you told us that you were the way. And Lord, according to your word, we do grieve. But you've told us that we don't grieve as those who have no hope. Because you are the resurrection and the life. I pray that not just what we're doing this day, but what you want to prepare for us in heaven and eternal life would, be, would become even more part of our reality. So this morning, we just want to lift up to you, Chili and Mylea and Lyric. And not only that little family, but, their, but the rest of their family that are really grieving this morning. We pray for Dick and Linda, and we thank you that Linda's home from the hospital. And we pray for Gina and Ted and Diane. And you've told us in your word, Lord Jesus, that... that you give a peace that passes all human comprehension. And we just pray that peace on this dear family right now. And that they could just rest and know that you're in control of not only life, but you're in control of death. And that to be absent from this body is to be present with you. Thank you that Diana is not only with you in heaven, Lord Jesus, and totally healthy, but she's with her son. She's with the saints that have gone before. And that she's happy. And that one day we'll all be together again. And Lord, thank you for the life Thank you for the life of the mother that gave you birth, Jesus, and how she teaches us from your word on how we too can handle death. May our faith be greater than the grave. Teach us from your word this morning as we remember your sacrifice, Heavenly Father. And how you sent your only begotten son into the world to die for us, to die for all mankind, that we could live again. That death isn't the end, but that you truly are the rock of ages. So we would put our faith in you. Help us to think bigger than what our eyes can see and what our hearts know. In Jesus' name, amen. God truly is full of surprises. When we expect his pitch to be low and on the inside, it sails high and outside. When we look for him at the front door, he shows up at the back door. And when you think he's going to do something, well, he holds back. Jesus did the same thing 
when Lazarus was dying. Lazarus was his friend. You'd think he'd come running. But that's not the way it went down. You know, when you study the Gospels, have you ever noticed that Jesus didn't run anywhere? And when we're ready to give up hope, well, that's when Jesus comes out of nowhere. He is full of surprises. The parting of the Red Sea, the walls of Jericho coming down, You just can't count God out of anything. Jesus said in Matthew 19, 26, with God, all things are possible. Do you believe that? So do I. It must have seemed impossible for Zacharias and Elizabeth to have a child. After all, Elizabeth was 80 years old. But the Lord had a surprise in mind. And from the time of Malachi to the birth of Jesus Christ, there's kind of a dead space of 400 years. It was a long, dark time. But as Malachi put it in chapter 4, verse 2, the Son of Righteousness would arise with healing in its wings. So hope still burned. But it dimmed, it burned dimly under Herod's rule. He would be the one to slaughter all the babies in Bethlehem. The righteous had to really strain hard to see the harbinger of what the prophets foretold. Everything that we've been studying in the Old Testament. Isaiah had prophesied chapter 43 through 8 that before the glory of the Lord would be revealed, a forerunner would be, pre- be sent to prepare the way of the Lord. Luke tells the story in chapter 1. If you'll turn there, please. Norm, Norm started our Christmas season off last week with Matthew's account. This morning you're going to get Luke's account and next week Mike will give you John's account. Luke chapter 1, 5 through 7. In the days of Herod, king of Judah, there was a priest named Zacharias of the division of Arbajah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both advanced in years. There wasn't any parental pride that filled their hearts. But in this aging old couple, God planted a seed and a hope for the world. While Zacharias was on duty one day, and the people were outside praying, We'll listen to what Luke says in 11 through 14. An angel of the Lord appeared to him standing to the right of the altar of incense. Zacharias was troubled when he saw the angel and fear gripped him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will give him the name John, and you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. And the angel went on to say that he would be great in the sight of the Lord and a forerunner to prepare the way of the Lord in verses 15 through 17. And Malachi's prophecy would come true. The Messianic son would rise on Israel, and the one to prepare the nation To greet the dawn would be Zacharias' son, John. That John, by the way, is John the Baptist. We read in verse 18, Zacharias said to the angel, How can I know this for certain? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. Like us sometimes, Zacharias was living in the backwash of his own limitations. He couldn't foresee the wonder of what God wanted him to believe. 
And that's what Christmas is all about, isn't it? It's the wonder of what God wants us to believe. It's about a baby and a savior and the promise of eternal life. Do you believe? Zacharias at the time, he didn't get it. There was actually unbelief in his heart, the Bible says in verse 20. So Zacharias was silenced, and he couldn't speak, the Bible tells us, until his son was born. Okay, try to imagine, Zacharias was a priest. He was supposed to be God's spokesman, but because of his unbelief, he couldn't tell of the most exciting news from heaven in 400 years. He couldn't talk about it. But something happened. When he returned home, his wife Elizabeth did become pregnant, just like the angel had said. And for me, the story of Zacharias and Elizabeth shows that our impossibilities are the platforms on which God does his best work. Have you ever lost hope that a certain family member would change their ways? If you're unemployed, do you wonder if you'll ever find that right job? Do you wonder if you'll ever be happy again? Do you really believe that the babe was born in Bethlehem was the savior of the world and he came to give eternal life? Do you really believe? Nothing frustrates God. When it looks its darkest, that's when God does his best work. And when God says not now or wait, it doesn't necessarily mean no. Just trust him in the waiting. And if you're like me, I know that that's really hard. The story we're reading about this morning is impossible situations. Zacharias and Elizabeth, they didn't think they'd ever have a baby. But it happened. So what's your impossible situation? Yours. What's your feelings of loss? This morning, I want you to give them to Jesus. Even Zacharias' son, John, later. This is John the Baptist. Later in life, remember, he was a man of the wilderness. But one day, God told him to go before Herod and knock off what he was doing. And Herod got so mad at him, he put him in prison. Okay, it's hard to imagine John the Baptist in prison. But in his doubt, in his despair, he sent some of his disciples to Jesus, we see. The story is told in Matthew eleven two 2 through 6, to ask Jesus this question. Are you really the one? Yeah, it came from John the Baptist. Are you the one we've been looking for? Or do we look for another? And I tried to imagine in my own mind this past week, you know, what did Jesus, did he get mad? I think he just smiled. And this is what he says, said, the Bible tells us there. He said, you go tell John the blind see, the lame walk, and the dead are raised. The gospel is preached. And John died in heaven. But maybe Diana has already met John the Baptist. I don't know. Heaven is a place. It's a forever place where we're going to be with Jesus. What are some of the amazing things that you've seen Jesus do in your life? Through people 
and circumstances. Remember when I told you to write them down? Because when you doubt like John the Baptist, you become overwhelmed by it. All you see is your own prison. Don't you younger ladies ever wonder about who you, who you will marry and what it will be like to have a family of your own? Mary's marriage was an arranged marriage. And she would dream of children. But never does she imagine the child that God has for her. Then she comes face to face with an angel. It was the same angel that Zechariah meant in the temple. That would have been Gabriel. So I'm sure you have your Bibles open still to Luke chapter 1. Let's read 26 and 27. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to the city of Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Well, twice in verse 27, Luke refers to Mary as a virgin, a virgin being someone who hasn't had a sexual relationship. Verse 28 And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. This is mighty Gabriel, the one who stands before the Lord. And he deals gently with Mary, who's just a teenage girl. And he calls her favored one. Can you imagine? Because God had chosen her above all the women of the earth to receive this gift. Mary, verse 29, tells us that she's perplexed. So Gabriel goes on with his message in 30 through 33. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus. And he will be great, and he will be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his his kingdom will have no end. For generations, people had waited for this great deliverer that Gabriel is describing right here. People searched the scriptures for clues about the one foretold, the son of the Most High God, verse 32. Fathers taught their families to watch for him. Mothers looked into the eyes of their newborns and wondered, is this the one? And now God is finally saying, enough waiting. The Messiah would come through a virgin. Becky was reading for me as we were waking up in the very early hours this morning of how God could have revealed himself. And one of the ways um, this writer wrote it was he could have gone through stadiums on a fiery chariot announcing the news that a Savior would be born. But God chose to bring his son in through the miracle of of the incarnation in the dark womb of a virgin. And Mary must have furrowed her brow just a little bit. Remember, Zacharias, verse 20, was an unbelief. Mary, however, doesn't ask for proof. She simply wonders about the process. How can a virgin have a baby? So Gabriel explains, verse 35. Follow me here. I hope you have your Bibles open for this. The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. Okay, so now you have the Holy Spirit. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Now you have God the Father. And for that reason, the Holy Child will be called the Son of God. 
Do you see the presence of the Trinity here in the conception? The Holy Spirit will come upon Mary and spark the divine life in her human body. The power of the Most High, that is God the Father, would overshadow her, preserving the purity of the embryo and producing the holy offspring. And the holy child would be called the Son of God. God the Father is involved. God the Holy Spirit, pardon me, would have been first God the Holy Spirit, God the Father, and God the Son. The virgin birth is how God stepped into our humanity. Without the virgin birth, you don't have a perfect Savior. You don't have a perfect sacrifice. You have no hope. I don't know if Mary tried to figure out the theological implications here, but I don't think that's why God chose her. I think he chose her because of her purity of heart. And Gabriel goes on to tell her in 36 and 37, And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age, and she who was called barren is now in her sixth month. For nothing will be impossible with God. If that's not underlined in your Bibles, you just might want to do it. Because we're all going to come to an impossible situation in our lives. Nothing will be impossible with God. Mary will bear God's son. But because she's not married, the privilege will come at a price. There will be accusations, pointed fingers, whisperings. I don't know if you ever really thought about this, but I believe that Mary was going to have her own Gethsemane. You ever been in the Garden of of Decision? In a matter of minutes, the encounter is over. Mary is alone in stunned silence. She's going to have a baby. But who can she tell? She would naturally want to tell Joseph. Okay, you guys, put yourself in Joseph's place. (laughs) You might have a little problem with that. I don't think Joseph completely initially understood until the angel spoke to him in a dream. If she tells the rabbis, well, she might get stoned. So she goes to be with Elizabeth and Zacharias, 39 through 41. Elizabeth knows she herself carries the forerunner, that is John the Baptist. But where's the Christ coming from? The answer is clear the moment that Elizabeth hears Mary's voice in verses 42 through 46. And this is, this is Elizabeth now speaking. And she cried out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears... The baby leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary's response is called the Magnificent. Um, I think it was last Tuesday, my family and I with some of you um, went to went to the movies. Man, we hadn't been into the, the theater. I guess I can say that word in church um, for uh, for for years. But it was a great movie to go to, and um, it was um, it was about the birth of Christ, and and in that it pictures um, Mary giving 
the Magnificent, where she praises God for His grace in her life, and she, she pours her life out in this song. And I can't say, you know, as I look back through time, that I've never really studied this passage of Scripture much, but it's taken on really new meaning for me. And I'd like to read that for you. It's in 46 through 56. This is Mary's response to what the angel has told her and and whom she is carrying. And Mary said, My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit is rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from now, from this time on, On all generations will count me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is upon generations after generations towards those who fear him. He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in thought and in their heart. He has brought down rulers from their thrones and exalted those who were humbled. He has filled the hungry with good things. And sent the rich, and sent the rich empty, and sent away the rich empty-handed. He has given help to Israel, his servants, in remembrance of his mercy. He has spoken to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. And Mary stayed with her about three months, and then she returned to her home. So three months later, she goes back to Mary, to Mary Joseph. And I'm sure that there were, that there were rumors. It wasn't going to be easy for Mary. Now because she was the mother of Jesus Christ, you would think that um, things might go easy for her. But remember the prophecy of Simeon? I believe it's in chapter 2, 35. Simeon said, a sword's going to pierce your heart. She would watch her son die. Some of you, I know some of you as parents have lost a child. And I can't think of anything more heartbreaking. So did Mary. Mary. But then Jesus had to die on the cross for her sin and mine and yours and all of mankind. And then there's the story, I think it's in chapter 4 of Luke where, uh, where they're going to Passover and they lose Jesus. <laughs> but they find him in the temple. It's the last time you hear of Joseph, isn't it? A sword would pierce her heart. But I think Mary knew in her her heart that she'd be with Jesus again and she'd be with Joseph again. Because she saw the big picture. And when she was ridiculed for being pregnant, she knew the real story of the wonderful gift that God gave to her. And so do we. Just thinking about what we do well as Protestants and what we don't do that good in. What we could maybe learn a thing from our Catholic brothers and sisters. I think there's a lot to be learned from Mary. From her life, I have to see 
that no conception is ill-timed if you believe that God is in control. We, we want to believe that God is in control of all the good things that are happening. But I don't believe that anything's outside His control. You know, you've probably never thought of it this way, but Jesus was the result of an unplanned pregnancy. Do you know anyone who ever got pregnant and it wasn't exactly planned or expected? I don't think a child is a mistake. How do you view life? I'm guessing most of you here are believers. Do you see life from a human or a divine point of view? Mary could have reacted to Gabriel's message from a human perspective. I can't have a baby. The timing's just all wrong. The room's not done. But she remained open and she saw things from God's perspective. And that's where Mary's submission comes into play where I think I and maybe all of us can learn more. In all the times I've shared with you the Christmas story, I've kind of passed over a verse that's hit me in a new way this year. It's verse 38 of chapter 1 where Mary looks at the angel and she says this, Behold the bond slave of the Lord, be it done unto me according to your word. Makes me ask, how do I see the events in my life? How do you see them in yours? Do we live on a horizontal plane objecting certain things that don't go the way we want them to go or out of sync with our timetable? When maybe we need to ask the Lord to help us to see things from His point of view with eternity in mind. I think we're here to get a job done. That's why the Lord didn't take us home right after we put our faith in Him. But sometimes we get so wrapped up in the here and the now that we forget that we're a kingdom people and we need to be doing what the Lord commissioned us to do. What looks like a problem today may turn out to be a gift that's used by God for tomorrow. This Christmas season, are we willing, like Mary, to submit our understanding to God, His will, and His word? That's the question I would ask you this morning. Mary prayed didn't pray, but said, it's right there in 38, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, be it done unto me according to your word. Could we really say that? There was a real cost for Mary in saying that. But the Lord's looking for those whom he can use. Because he's building his kingdom. I think we have much to learn from Mary's example. Of him who was foretold. So as we go to prayer this morning, I want you to think about your impossible situation. We know from Zechariah and Elizabeth, it was a baby in their old age. For Mary, it was giving birth to the Son of God, verse 35 even though she was a virgin. 
What do we need to give to Jesus and then trust him for? Over and over in my life, it seems that's what the Lord wants to be teaching me. And I don't think it's just me. I think it's all of us. Because we want to put our faith and trusting our trust in something substantial that we can hang on to. When he's told us from his word that he wants us to trust him with all our hearts and not lean on our own understanding or try to figure it out because we can't. Are you, am I willing like Mary to say, behold the bond slave of the Lord, be it done unto me according to your word. Let's go to prayer. Lord Jesus, help us to see things from your perspective. Not living on a horizontal plane, but a vertical one. Submitting our wills to you, just like we're seeing Mary here. Thank you, God, for sending Jesus and your gift of love to all mankind. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for coming into the world and dying on the cross for our sin. We know that nothing is impossible for you. So we give you this morning our impossible situations. Help us to be able to say like Mary, Behold the bond slave of the Lord. Be it done unto me according to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and continue to worship the, the Lord who came to earth to save us. We will 
will shout it out For the Lord our God Almighty reigns He is with us, He is with us now For the Lord our God Almighty reigns From the mountains we will shout it out For the Lord our God Almighty reigns He is with us, He is with us now For the Lord our God Almighty reigns good, for He is good. He was born to conquer the grave. Light of the world, the reason for Christmas. Sing, O oh, you people, the Lord Almighty reigns. Sing, every creature of God, come bless His name. For He is good, for He is good. He was born Oh, oh. 
Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your love and your kindness and for the promise of heaven. It's more than a hope, Lord. It's an assurance. It's a, it's a guarantee because of your son coming to this earth, being born of the virgin, and being perfectly God and perfectly man, and then dying on the cross for us. We have the absolute assurance that we will be with you one day and join all those who have gone before. So, Lord, help us to live like those who have that hope and that assurance and help us, Lord, to be the kind of people that will tell others and share that, that great news for all people. Uh, go before us this week, Lord, and help us to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great week.